Hey, welcome to Landfest Infernal Land Mayhem event. I'm Nixie Pixel on Twitch and on YouTube. Up next is our Gaming for Good panel with some panelists that may surprise you. But first and foremost, I want to mention that this weekend we're supporting Engineers Without Borders. EWB is pursuing a vision of a world where every community has the capacity to sustainably meet their basic human needs. If you share in that mission, our goal is $4,000 for this event. Head over to donate.landfest.com. Now let's learn how we can change the world. So even though there are 2.2 billion of us gamers, gaming has been a tumultuous place of how it's viewed in society. Today, we're challenging the age-old stigma that games are for ambitionless couch and or basement dwellers with three incredible panelists that aim to show that gaming is actually great for the world at large and holds huge promise for social impact. So if you guys don't know, I'm Nixie. I'm a tech educator and former host of Discovery Channel. Uh, I've been a part of Tech TV and G4 TV, and I turned YouTuber. In 2017, I created my own open source community, Geek Beacon, and that's a not-for-profit uh, fellowship of geeks that shares my open source values and dedication to social good. And we have a total reach of 400,000 strong. We run events with a focus on mental health, uh, crowdsourcing 3D uh, printers for PPE during the um, COVID times, and we've partnered with Sony to help make accessible controllers more accessible for people. And uh, we're teaming up with LandFest to assist the gaming community at large with panels such as this one. So I'm very happy to announce here that Geek Bingen is kicking off our first open culture celebration, and that's going to be celebrating open source, open technology, gaming, uh, and that's happening in Q4 with a full speaker lineup. So you can go check that out at gbffest.org. The three amazing panelists are as follows. Hey, Jeremy. Jeremy De La Rosa is a 10-year veteran of Blizzard Entertainment with nearly two decades of experience in the technology sector. As a producer at Blizzard, he helped launch over seven AAA titles, awesome, such as Overwatch, Hearthstone, Diablo, and my personal favorite, StarCraft. He spent several years living abroad in France and led to digital marketing, international operations, and business development efforts. Jeremy helped launch multiple esports leagues, including the Overwatch League and Hearthstone Championship Tour, while also heading up Blizzard's collegiate esports program, TESPA. He is the founder and CEO of Leyline, a social impact organization, and Leyline is a not-for-profit, open source, and open knowledge project that is building an ecosystem of positive impact and using the power of gaming and NFTs. If you don't know what an NFT is, this is like your, your challenge, non-fungible token, right? That's right. <laughs> I have to explain because it's very, uh, yeah. very complex. Yeah, and um, and that will happen in a bit. So, um, hey, Anthony, Dr. Anthony Bean is a licensed clinical depth psychologist, video game researcher, CEO of Geek Therapeutics, and president at the Telos Project. It's a thriving nonprofit gaming central mental health clinic. Anthony specializes in the use of video game character identification as a therapeutic technique, and he's also authored multiple academic articles, book chapters, and the two books, Working with Video Gamers in Games and Therapy, A Clinician's Guide, and The Psychology of Zelda, Linking Our World to the Legend of Zelda series. I like that, Linking Our World pun. <laughs> we like play on words. Yeah, <laughs> same. Okay, and last but not least, hi, Tom. Tom Butler holds a Master of Public Health degree and an MS in Marriage and Family Therapy. He's a founder of the Pro Battle League, an esports organization that's focused on developing 24 healthy gaming communities across North America. Tom is also helping to develop an esports management program through the Milgard Business uh, School and Sports Enterprise Program at WashU. Are you guys all gamers? I feel like that's kind of goes without saying, but it's entirely possible or not. <laughs> um, let's go with Anthony. What What's your favorite game? Do you have any have games? Be, definitely have to be The Legend of Zelda on that one. <laughs> uh, that was the first book that was that we did. So definitely that one. Ocarina of Time for people who are going to ask that one. Oh, geez. I, I had a friend that used to play the Ocarina and I was super jealous. If you've ever, if you've never seen an Ocarina, it's kind of like a really ornate recorder yeah definitely one, one of my good friends can play it with his nose oh wow, <laughs> wow. Fun fact. 
<laughs> it's disgusting, but it's very entertaining. I was going to say insert clip here, but possibly <laughs> not. <laughs> I think I could find some if you need it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, what about you, Tom? Uh, that's a broad question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of games for different moods I'm in, but I, I think for this discussion, like I, I'd have to go with Minecraft. We just have uh, used Minecraft in a lot of ways, a lot of fun ways, creative ways, and and building social online social interaction with with young people. So that's uh, I'll give a shout out to Minecraft community. Oh yeah, the Minecraft community. It's it's kind of one of those. I remember meeting the developers of Minecraft, and they were so timid in like at a game developer conference, and it was just like what what is your game and they're like oh, it's minecraft and there were like three people and now it's just you know they sold the microsoft so it's like it's incredible um what about you jeremy same favorites uh warcraft 3 uh yeah. it's uh you know not just i worked at blizzard uh but it's before <laughs> i worked there um you know the uh one, RTSs are fantastic. The game design and the balance between asymmetric races was incredible. Uh, the leveling up of heroes and, you know, the variety that came in there, the story is incredible. And even bigger was that it created a platform for people to create modded games, which gave birth to tower defenses, to Dota. League uh, of so Legends. A, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's one of my, certainly one of my favorites. Uh, had a big influence in my life. Yeah, I, I whenever somebody says like they played uh, Fr Frozen Throne, I'm just kind of it, which was like a mod that kind of paved the way for League of Legends. I'm kind of like your OG, you know, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, if you don't mind me asking, Jeremy, since we're um, chatting with you, how did you find this career path in gaming? Um, you know, since we all come from gaming backgrounds, like what steps led you to where you are today? Yeah, uh, you know, I think gaming has always been a part of um, my my life, uh, even started from childhood, uh, playing with like Coleco, Atari, Commodore 64, Amiga. And, uh, you know, I spent a, a lot of time uh, as a bit of an introvert playing tons and tons of games. And it actually, you know, taught me a lot of problem solving and a lot of thinking about algorithms and development. So I ended up going into technology, studying computer science um, in college, uh, but then also realizing and shifting into more project management and product management, because I felt those are my natural strengths versus coding. Um, and I was working in tech in New York for a while, and I actually had a concern that going into video games was going to be a grind and I'd be working all the time because it has a pretty bad reputation for that. Uh, but there was in New York grinding and <laughs> working overtime all the time with these tech companies, uh, basically focusing on like ad tech. So uh, I read a Gama Sutra article on what it was like working over at Blizzard and the culture. And uh, I applied on a whim and got really lucky that they brought me over and flew me out and interviewed. So it was very much a, a dream job for me. And, you know, I think being able to bring in that kind of experience being a gamer being a customer really helps to plug into being a developer because you really understand your product and you're actually uh, playing and understanding it and you essentially dog food it so when something's not working well you're the one that's got to fix it uh, so it was a pretty nice journey i think like getting into stem and tech was really the key because um, that's when you kind of realize that uh, there's just so much potential in this industry mm. What about you, Tom? We'll do some like, I have so many questions and I want to open it up to a discussion group after, but what about you, Tom? How did you find your career path and what step, steps led you to where you are today? Well, I never imagined that I'd be where I am today. Um, I, But I was a huge fan of video games and really, you know, being old enough to see the evolution of video games and just the whole animation interactivity, you know, it just really was something that that connected with the way I think. Um, but I read a book called Rise of the Creative Class by Richard Florida quite a while ago. And so I got really interested in how to develop, you know, the collision between creativity and technology. And I'm in the Seattle area. And so that's, you know, a big collision of creativity and technology in the gaming industry up here. Uh, got looking at what would be a place that I might fit. 
and just got really uh, interested and sucked in by the competitive entertainment aspect of, of video games. And, and that's how he ended up launching an esports organization. Mm -hmm. Anthony? So I've been a gamer since I was three years old. I still remember my first uh, first memory of uh, an N64, not N64, sorry, NES, um, and Adventure Island, if anyone's ever played that. That one is hard for a three-year-old to do because I'm just smashing buttons trying to make, a, make sense of it. But I remember that and getting to the, like the fourth level, and then I don't think I've ever played that game since. Uh, but career path wise, it's kind of kind of gone on from uh, high school. I've always been a, a gamer, working with uh, video games, uh, dredging myself through anime and other stuff like that. Uh, but also going through college, uh, research has always been focused on video gamers. What can we do to understand them better? Because I don't necessarily agree with that violence uh, aggression debate uh, where a lot of people try to push a lot of the the narrative that video games are bad and cause violence and stuff like that because it just my research is obviously super flat uh but we'll, we'll probably get into that a little bit uh but it, it basically has come all the way to my doctorate program where i've been working with uh kids as young as uh, four years old all the way up to actually 89 in in lots of different things such as substance use abuse uh, working with uh, kids in the, on the, uh, the autism spectrum, all the way to just teenagers in high school, of really focusing on what are the strengths that the video games can give them. Because as we all know, uh, in order to program a game, you have to have rules and boundaries. And those rules and boundaries can be very, what we call clinically ex extrapolated into real life world. And one, it's a wonderful rapport building, but two, it's also a a really awesome way to to get the the clients to understand and and utilize the stuff they learn in the games outside as well when we can utilize it from a metaphorical standpoint as well so having gaming be just like the foundational building blocks of your experience in childhood one of the things that um i didn't know i think 10 years ago like we didn't have gaming degrees like that was another thing. I don't know how far back the, the rabbit hole goes and when you got certified or when you went to school. But I guess my discussion group question for you guys would be like entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> how did you, it, it's risky to decide to go into games for reasons that you kind of mentioned also, Anthony, about, you know, um, it can be divisive, even though there's billions of us that game, there's still kind of stigma around that. So what made you kind of like take that risk? And, um, you know, this is an open discussion. So if you guys want to like chime in, feel free for me, um, just to kind of weigh in on my personal experience, I, um, I was in video game journalism. At first it started off with just working at TV stations, talking about things that I had, like, I didn't care at all about. And then I realized there was like that aha moment that I can, do like I can be in games like and that wasn't that wasn't even a degree program that exists and now I'm learning about cybersecurity, which is the the degrees for that are also really minimal so um what what made you guys take that risk of going into games I know that Jeremy took quite a bit of a risk from one of the <laughs> one of the interviews after you left Blizzard for instance you said you you basically like sold your house and and like decided to be, you know, start, start up the ley line, you know, so. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, I spent a long time at Blizzard and I started to see how, you know, deep in the guts of that system, how these large private corporations operate international uh, corporations and all the shenanigans that can take place there. And the biggest thing that I saw was, you know, the, the sheer amount of gamers uh, over two, you mentioned 2.2, uh, some of the stats I saw are 2.7 billion gamers and the growth rate enough, is ridiculous. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my question was, okay, how much of that energy and computing power and cognitive problem solving power is getting redirected to actually solve problems in the real world, both for people and planet? And the answer was barely even 1%. And that was deeply concerning to me because, you know, we're spending more and more time gaming on average, and there are pretty straightforward ways for us to repurpose and integrate the outputs of this into benefits for society. 
So I tried for about six years to, to make progress there over at Blizzard, failing over and over again to get people to prioritize some of these like key features or initiatives. And you know, typically there is this corporate social responsibility, but inherently what happens is that people don't prioritize these kind of projects because it's just not profitable to do good. So, you know, I decided to leave because I wanted to have a bigger impact and I saw the opportunity. And in particular, the trends are just so crazy in the rapid growth of just even internet connection. And with younger generations, even in the US, it's approaching over 90% of teens and adolescents are now gamers. So what are we going to do? And my, you know, so my hypothesis is let's leverage that, let's leverage the momentum that's happening in blockchain and crypto, let's mash them together and point all of that towards supercharging nonprofit social impact organizations and anybody that's trying to improve the state of the world. Um, and the problem is our economy doesn't necessarily reward those behaviors. And to me, it's okay, if we just change the flow of money to reward good things, that can empower everybody to, um, to, take, to participate, even these tiny steps. You multiply that by 2 billion, you can make a big difference. And at the same time, you make it easy and pay people to do that, you can start to actually have an impact on poverty too. So, you know, our focus here is really about supercharging other organizations, including uh, Anthony's. You know, we, we've been talking about how can we support mental health efforts, and he's doing exactly the work that we really want to celebrate. Um, and yeah, tie it into your digital identity. So yeah. I'll pause there. There's just a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just uh, doing so by utilizing your computers. Like, what another thing that I think about is how celebrating the the laziness of people too you know like utilizing computers latent resources um has been uh and and this again ties into to your project at leyline but has been um done in like a folding at home if you guys are familiar with um being able to you know sequence the genome in a crowdsource manner like that's super nerdy but <laughs> um yeah, so if you guys feel free to like banter amongst yourselves if you want, I'm trying to take myself out of the equation a little bit more. Well, I, I think that um, what Jeremy said there about making an impact, I think that, that that's a key, you know, and from an entrepreneurial perspective, it, you have to be, um, you have to embrace the grind, you know, and so, you know, we felt like we could make a difference. Um, we felt like we could bring some a unique perspective of competitive entertainment to the esports space, to the gaming space, and um, and that has kept us going. And you know, in the esports space is a tough space, and you know it's uh, a lot of money comes in, but it's still not uh, economically healthy. You know, there's still a lot to um, to do to make the esports space a, a solid, solid space. So you you have to believe in something. You know, when things aren't working out, deals aren't working out the way you want them, um, uh, you, you know, you have to believe it, that you can have that impact, that you can, you can make a difference. Esports is something that um, just, I remember doing like the very first shout casting thing. I did it at PAX. It's a conference um in seattle <laughs> and i remember signing myself for uh self up for you know helping with league of legends and all of a sudden i didn't realize but they like took the entire hall and it that was when it hit me that it's like esports is huge and you know like Fortnite is also like an easy it's just the the aspect of esports and the competitive nature of it i i would like how do you guys approach toxic gaming communities and the competitive nature of it as well like that's an interesting well, I dynamic. Think that's, yeah, and I think that's uh, something that really interests the behavioral science scientists in me, you know, because it's the truth of the matter is you see so much good um, in stick and ball youth sports. You see so much good mentoring that goes on. And that's the kind of organization that we want to build, an organization that, that um, uses the interest in the competitive video game um, uh, culture to create opportunities to uh, to teach good things, and so and, and that toxicity is one of the things. And emotions run high, you know. And Dr. Bean, you know, knows he's probably seen, 
you know, the emotions running high um, when someone's getting beat rather than winning. And, um, you know, so it's how, and that creates a teachable moment. And so again, by focusing on creating healthy competitive entertainment or, or communities, then it, it really is about bringing in resources that, that, can, uh, that can connect with younger gamers all the way up and develop them. Um, so that they have a, a healthy perspective of, of the competitive uh, arena. And, and to, to, to kind of jump on that one a little bit, it, when, when we think about like gaming, esports and stuff like that, news places really in, in uh, the media culture likes to really just hone in on like a couple things that they're like, oh my gosh, look, there's this huge big thing that happened. There is uh, this kid who threw a controller looking video gaming is bad. And you're like, hey, man, you know, that's that's not even like a thousandth of a percent of the entire population. Yeah, there's always going to be some people who do it. But you have football players who who throw the football or take their helmet and chuck it until it smashes. I mean, there, there's lots of different types of uh, competitive uh, environments that are out there. And I think that what, what Tom said was, was correct. Like we're going to see a lot of increase in, in some behavioral mechanisms when the, the competitive streak gets, gets created and, and touched upon. And it's really focuses a little bit more on how do we create that as a teachable moment for the person to be one mindful of the situation that's in front of them, knowledge that this isn't always how it is. And maybe, you know, when we work with pro gamers and esports gamers, they're they're going for eight to 10 hours at a time. Like you need breaks. Like when we work with uh, the esports people down here in Texas, we tell them the number one thing is you need to have them on a schedule where they have a break because as soon as they get up to a certain point and they had hit that losing streak, it, it becomes a downward spiral for anyone. But that's not just gaming. That's anyone that would be in a competitive environment. It reminds me of Jeremy talking about uh, avoiding possibly going for a CS degree because of the the crunch, the the the, the issue with crunch, you know. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> we've got a culture that celebrates overtime and lack of sleep, which is actually very destructive for all of our you know general health. And I, I think there is opportunity to start to reshape that culture through conversation and community and shared values. Um, but there's also this other element in technology side where you have the power of connected uh, individuals, uh, huge data sets. So what we found is there's these huge opportunities when it comes to behavioral economics, where you can just plug in these small little nudges that will help to give uh, positive interactions between people. So I want to give examples of that with Overwatch at the end of a match when you're you know, basically saying, hey, this person played really well, let me give them a vote. That encouragement already starts to shape people's mindsets where instead of finishing a match, you're like, this is a terrible, oh, I hate all my teammates. You're instead thinking about what are the good things they actually contributed to, which totally flips the, the kind of script. Um, that people create for themselves. And it changes their um, experience as well as those around them. So it creates this positive feedback loop. Um, so there's all these little micro interactions you can create that start to at least bring some positive positivity into that. Uh, and particularly with uh, competition. So for example, Overwatch League, um, we also put a lot of emphasis into coaches and therapists and trainers that they would help uh, oversee these individuals, find when they had burnout or if they had issues, keep that, keep on top of that because it's really hard to maintain that yourself uh, and to look after yourself when you're just so heavily competitive. Um, so there's lots of opportunity to shape the culture here and also bring in technology to drive behavior in the right way. Reminds me of playing Fortnite and then having someone kick you it from the party just accidentally and then it says like, this take this opportunity to reflect on your behavior <laughs> and yeah, i just I like mean, preemptively and, and on a flip side you know we would identify who the trolls were and who get costly reported so what uh, happened is you start to like shift them over into their isolated communities where you put oh, all the trolls together instead of mixing them in with the positive population that's what's happening and the data <laughs> back end like there's an yeah. algorithmic analysis mm -hmm. on on trolls that's yeah. really interesting yeah. What, yeah. One of my uh, one of my friends who works for uh, Riot Games actually, she's a used to be a licensed psychologist, and now she does research, and she talks exactly about what Jeremy just said. 
was that they find the toxicity, they they then start to try to engage that person. How can we change that? How can we do something different? If they don't, then they start to pair them in this specific algorithm to get them into, uh, so if they're not gonna enjoy the game, then hopefully they will quit it. But that, that I think League of Legends is notorious for the toxicity um, that is in that that game. Um, and it's I don't think it's gonna go anywhere anytime soon. I want to give gaming in general, like the trajectory of games and technology, a pat on the back, because back in the day, you you had like gamers had no say on the development of a game. Now we have, you know, alpha releases where you're paying essentially full price for the game before it's released, which is interesting. Um, and now they can tell, you know, based on uh, gamer feedback, exactly like how they felt about a game, their behavior in a game. That's just something that I never thought in a million years would be possible in games. You know, um, I, I kind of want to ch change the subject just a teeny bit on why, and maybe this is a brief conversation because you guys are clearly gamers, but why did you choose games to be your platform for social good as opposed to other avenues? Like, um, you know, assuming you are people of varied interests, like Tom, why did you choose gaming to be your platform? Well, I think it comes down to where's the future? You know, we end up talking about the, the gaming generation and, you know, if you're going to impact social change, I mean, I really love the fact that, um, you know, you're dealing with 89 year olds, um, it, you know, and I think there is definitely there's been some really interesting conversations we've had about competitive gaming in, uh, with a nursing home chain. Um, and that's, you know, that's a fun project. But um, the, you know, but if you want to impact um, the future generation, then, you know, using gaming as a way to do that to me is is really the only choice and you know and, and it's there's so much fun around it as well and there's so much fun in the community as well so there's a real positive dynamic to it as well as you know be able to reach a lot of younger people i i want to dig in into this nursing home competitive gaming thing so i want to add another question on top of on top of why did you choose gaming which is can you think of um, one of your favorite stories that came out of your mission? So perhaps you would like to uh, tell me more about this nursing home gaming thing. Well, again, <laughs> and I'm gonna call on you individually. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, it was kind of at the start of COVID that we started having a conversation and then it, it immediately got sidelined, especially here in Washington um, with uh, assisted living centers. But uh, but the, the concept is, and, and we'll get back to it, is that there is a, uh, an aspect of um, occupational therapy and physical therapy that becomes fun if you can have a little bit of competition going uh, along with it. And so we haven't really um, done much with it, but the, you know, video games are being used a lot in assisted living centers um, to, to have a fun uh, um, dynamic game, gaming dynamic with some of the therapy that's going on. And then just the socialization as well. And so having you know, some socialization going on between different centers online, um, that's something to explore as well. So yeah, it's a fun project. I'm looking forward to having more discussion with it. As far as, you know, the kind of the most impactful story, um, I've had more than one person come up. Um, we were active, we have been active in the Halo space. Um, and so I've had more than one person say to me, you know, this game saved my life. And when they're talking about that, they're not really, you know, talking about the game. I mean, the game is engaging, but they're talking about the community. They're talking about having a focus, you know, that um, gives them a focus on others in a, in a gaming situation rather than kind of getting lost in, in, in themselves. And they're talking about ha um, sometimes having a social outlet that they're not finding in other areas of their life. So, you know, again, to have gaming be so significant that people would say in a extremely heartfelt way this game saved my life 
you know, there's something deeper there than just pixels on a screen. I, I used to actually work in nursing homes too, uh, before I, I started the, the nonprofit, the Telos Project. Uh, so I, I down here in, in Texas, we actually would bring in a Mario Kart. That was, right. that was the one. And that was, <laughs> my gosh, that got tons of people out into the, the lunch area to be able to, to have take turns. And we'd bring in four controllers, we'd switch it out, let them play, but to have the, the audience engage themselves and get out of the rooms. Because one of the big things that, at least down here in Texas, that we've seen is once someone enters a nursing home, it's like they feel so secluded from life in a lot of different ways. And they will seclude themselves in their room to a point where it, it's unhealthy in, in for mental health wise. And so for us to, to be able to get them out, utilizing these different types of games, whether it's Mario Kart, um, Dungeons and Dragons, or a different type of a, a game in a tournament was be massively beneficial for, for these people. And I think that they, they even tried to uh, continue on the program that I was uh, helping to run in a couple of them um, after I, I left, but we, we saw a really good mental health increase for the, the geriatric population for those that are in there. And we, we also saw them start to utilize it in, in the OT area too, which was a lot more fun. Although the games I think were, lack of a better word, would have been a lot more engaging um, right. on some levels, but um, they're, they're not really designed uh, sometimes to, to be that way. <laughs> Well, I'm just really looking forward to having a picture of a room of residents with gaming jerseys on. That's my, that's what I oh, want to see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that would be amazing. I'm just thinking about, to share a little bit of my own um, situation, but my dad actually had a stroke and that, I don't think having any gaming-based therapy was available to him because he would have, if he was like, hey, you can beat you know, in occupational therapy, if you just do your dang therapy, you know, you can beat the Ethel at this, he would be like all on top of the competitive aspect of it. Um, but Jeremy, I want to give you uh, a chance to speak because I know that your project is a little bit more nuanced. So I want to give you the opportunity to explain a little bit more about Leyline. And also if you have a good story that came out your of your mission or service, um, I think that would be really cool. I don't want to forget that because it's like you said, it's and NFTs are hard to wrap your head around too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, to speak about like going into the space, you know, what we observe is it's really about the trends. And Tom, I totally agree that this is the future. Um, and you know, gaming in particular just is so engaging that it activates all these different motivators in you. And it's you know, learning, belonging, achievement, growth. And this is a platform to actually drive specific behavior. So what we are building is essentially this digital collectible game where you can essentially evolve your NFTs that represents the good that you've done in the world. So you essentially can donate blood to the Red Cross or leave your computer on and donate your extra cycles to scientific research on cancer and climate change. You can uh, exercise and ensure that you're taking care of your personal health. So there's all these categories of good that you can do. And so what we're doing is baking that into these NFTs, which are these immutable digital assets on the blockchain. Nobody can hack it and you own it which is the biggest difference in the entire tech world, where, uh, for example, in World of Warcraft, you can grind for hundreds of hours, get your epic gear, and you can sell it on eBay, for example. But if Blizzard says, hey, you don't own this anymore, I'm going to ban your account, or we're going to shut down the servers, or we're going to nerf your item, you lose all that value. Whereas in the new world on blockchain, there's a new business model, essentially play to earn. So you participate, you play your games, and you start to own these assets, which you can sell, you can finance, you can split into uh, different forms of assets. This entire new business space is, is an industry is being created as we speak. And then you can take those assets and transport them into other open worlds, other games on a blockchain. So if you've seen Ready Player One or read the book or Snow Crash, that metaverse is being built as we speak. So, you know, our focus here is we want to create this marketplace where people are earning these collectibles, leveling them up and unlocking new assets and art and video and audio, which are being donated to us from all these different creators. 
and you could sell them on a marketplace and a portion of those proceeds goes back to the creator too. So we're creating this passive income to all these individuals and these prizes in a prize pool, which are also donated by sponsors or part of our marketing budget is going to go to people that are in need. So for example, if you, you know, do some good in your local community, uh, you earn an NFT and you get a gift card embedded into that. That $25 Bitcoin gift card is already a year salary for an individual in the low income brackets in Venezuela. So that's really the hope is we're really mashing that all together, taking that whole gaming elements of collecting and achievement and growth and social connection, and then making sure that the output is empowering all these different causes. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that was uh, succinct enough to explain. It's uh, We're very much on kind of the bleeding edge here. So a lot of our core community is really heavily centered in the uh, blockchain NFT space, because what's happening now is that there's this giant gold rush going into that, that um, industry. And what we want to avoid is, hey, we, let's just stop making minting billionaires here and start giving this money back to the people and distribute it much more equitably. Um, which is why we are very specifically not for profit because there's a lot of value to be gained in this space. And so we want to be able to have this engine that redistributes that value back to people. Yeah, I want to, I mean, you said it perfectly, but I also want to stress the fact that um, I think a lot of these, the true ownerships of digital assets has, has come from a space of, um, so say Netflix or um, all these streaming services that you, are so convenient now to have um, Microsoft's streaming service where you have all these games that you can use or Steam is a great model. Like you, at the end of the day, you still don't own the games that you buy on Steam, which is a bit mind blowing if you think about it. So from a very simplistic viewpoint, the way that I, I think of it is, um, you know, a Netflix you know, you've always browsed Netflix and you've been like, hey, I want to watch, you know, this episode of Parks and Rec or something. And then they've pulled the license. So it really drives home the fact that you don't own anything. And I love the um, the concept of NFTs because it really provides, you know, the uh, the crypto technology allows you to truly own something that is digital. And that is that in and of itself is is mind blowing to be able to give that sense of ownership back and then going that extra mile to be able to use it for charitable purposes is really like, I feel like we could talk about that for a really long time. Just to wrap it up, I wanted to ask you um, what has surprised you the most about doing this work, um, preferably on the positive side and um, how can we follow your projects? Tom? I think that um, I was really pleased um, to see how much passion there was um, in communities. I hadn't really like um, dived into a community before we launched this project, but then we, we attracted people and, and we built our own community and, and just the level of enthusiasm, enthusiasm and passion, it just made things a lot of fun. And the PBL, we do things a little differently. We run things around seasons. So we're, we develop a season and then we release it. And so we're developing season four right now. And people can follow us on, on Twitter at Pro Battle League, at Pro Battle League on Twitter. That's the best place. Okay, Anthony, if you wouldn't mind. I have so many more questions about your book, but <laughs> that, that's okay. We, we, we can talk about that we can... later. Okay, perfect. Um, I would definitely say the, the thing that kind of surprised me the most is how welcoming the, the geek community is and all the other uh, variant communities, the, the, cl the clicks, the non-clicks, just how overwhelming uh, supportive everyone is of each other. And I think that is a, a, a massive testament to, to what I think all of us are trying to do in all of our own unique ways is to have that support from our fellow people. And we're, we're not necessarily like, say, they're not my next door neighbors. They're people over in Ireland. They're people over in China. They're here in the United States. We, we're all collaborating and connecting on a space through, through gaming because we're having very similar, what we'd call kind of like archetypal experiences. And I think that that is a, a wonderful boon for our, our futuristic uh, generations, but also where gaming is going to go. And that, that's what we kind of uh, focus heavily on when we, when we talk about geek therapeutics is the, is the idea of how can we 
focus on making sure that everyone has this information that we can get out uh, to them, but also to be able to, to train people how to, to manage whether, uh, whether it's video gamers, esports, individuals, understanding the culture, anime, manga, everything like that. The, the whole supremacy of geek culture is, is really what we, we focus heavily on. And then to be able to, to utilize it in a therapeutic setting. And so if people want to know a little bit more about us, you can just uh, search uh, at Geek Therapeutics on all social media and you'll find us. We're Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. We, we do all sorts of fun stuff. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, there, there's a lot of learnings to be had, a lot of hard lessons too. It's, it's hard to be an entrepreneur, I'll, I'll say that. And you know, I think we've all been through those types of journeys. But uh, one of the most surprising positive surprises I found is that it, particularly in a blockchain world, uh, because everything is connected and there's utility in sharing assets, everybody in the space just wants to work together. It's not about competition. You actually win by collaborating because for example, you know, we now network with a number of different blockchain games and they would want to have their assets portable and compatible onto our platform and vice versa. Ours would be compatible with them. So you're now taking your identity anywhere you go and the same profile, your same story of who you are and your accomplishments and the good that you've done are actually going all over the place. So this is actually so fascinating to see that this community is also so social good oriented. They know that the power that's going to bring to society is massive. So they just want us to help anybody that's trying to build something, no matter like where you're from, what you're doing, how small or big your project is. The uh, industry here is the total opposite of how the private sector currently works, which is basically super cutthroat, smash your competition and like dominate everything. Um, that's like, that's a wonderful thing to be, to connect with those type of kindred spirits. And it's just, everything's very purpose-driven. People are trying to have an impact and really trying to change the world in a, in a positive way. Um, so if you'd like to follow us, you know, we are essentially building our product uh, out in the open. So we're still in like proof of concept and alpha mode. Um, we're also a volunteer organization. So we've attracted about 70 people contributing to the project. Um, and we're trying to grow, grow our community on Discord. So check out our website, leyline.gg. In our footer, you can see all of our social media links. But biggest thing is come pop into our Discord. We'd love to have you. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're uh, doing some wild and crazy stuff over in blockchain world uh, and trying to bring some good into that space. I might have to have you back on, Jeremy, to be like blockchain 101, because <laughs> unless you want to stay another two hours, <laughs> I yeah, don't think you have uh, the time. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty deep, but, and I'm yeah. happy to share. Honestly, it's a, it's a very new and uh, cutting edge space. So I think just sharing knowledge is really important. So happy to kind of provide context and explain because there's a lot of like fear and uncertainty and doubt, but there's also a huge promise and want to really focus energy to kind of focus on these opportunities that we have. Yeah, same thing with, you know, game, gamer stigma, um, what how society paints gaming, you know, uh, rather than focus on the fear and uncertainty of that, you know, uh, let's focus on the good that can be done. And, you know, you guys are, are changing the world in uh, baby steps. And before you know it, it's going to be the cyclone of, you know, social good projects around gaming, social good projects around crowdfunded projects like blockchain. You know, I'm super happy you were able to join me and I, you love to see it. And um, thank you guys so much for joining me on the panel. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching our Gaming for Good panel at Infernal's Land Fest Mayhem event. I'm Nixie Pixel, and I hope that this helped you change your perspective on gaming, or maybe it validated you a little bit, and how gaming can be used for social change and good. Speaking of social change and good, if you had a chance to donate today, thank you so much. Your contributions are going to Engineers Without Borders. In the world's toughest places, they're installing solar panels to bring light where it's dark. They're digging for water so hope can spring from the ground. Any amount that you are able to give through donate.landfest.com, big or small, will help build the foundation for a community to thrive for years to come.